dollars. That get your attention a little bit? What would you be willing to do for $10 million? I mean, you think about it for just a minute. They actually did a, uh, it's been years ago now, they did a Gallup poll and asked that question. Just curious. The Gallup poll came back and said that uh, 25% of the people that they, when they did the little Gallup poll, 25% of the people for $10 million would abandon their families. For $10 million would abandon their families. Um, for $10 million, they would abandon their church. They said that 23% of them said they would, be, they would go into prostitution for a week. 23%. And 7% said they would kill a stranger for $10 million. Here's the really disturbing part. They dropped it down to $5 million and the results were the same. Four million, same. Three million, the same. Um, our society has lost its moral compass. Uh, and, and so as you don't get to feeling too good about that, um, Christians, when they surveyed Christians, they did a little poll of Christians and they said, uh, what percentage of people who claim to be Christians, and here was, the, here was how it came out, 94% of those who claim to be Christians said that they believed in God. Now you gotta, that's a little bit odd. I know, you got to think about that for a minute. They claim to be Christians. 94% of those who claim to be Christians said they believed in an actual literal God. 80, see if I get this right, 84% of those that they surveyed, Christians, said that they believed that Jesus is God's son. 84%. 10% called themselves committed Christians. 10%. Um, that is reflected in the polls. They did some other research and basically found out that for the most part, there's not really any distinction. There, there's only one distinction between people who, uh, Christians and non-Christians, and it's where they go on Sunday morning. That pretty much everything else is, for the most part, the same. Their morals, their character, their convictions, uh, their values, their entertainment, the way they spend their money, their families, pretty much everything is just pretty much the same, for the most part. Uh, we're doing a series uh, entitled Following God in a Fallen World, and I've taken it from the book of Daniel. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be there this morning again as we enter into the third uh, sermon in this series. Uh, following God in a Fallen World. Um, chapter 1, just to kind of give, we'll catch you up here in case you've missed the first two weeks. Uh, chapter 1 was talking about... Um, seeing life and circumstances in life as problems or opportunities. And that was that chapter one talks about how Jerusalem as a city and the people were conquered and destroyed. And then those who were left over were enslaved and carried off into uh, slavery. And uh, Daniel and his friends get to Babylon and they're spiritually challenged and um, indoctrinated into the culture and, and spent several years doing that. Chapter two, uh, last week, we talked about trusting God with the unknown and with the impossible. And chapter 2 tells that story of Daniel and his friends that are uh, marked for death by the king. And, and in the middle of that, that was that Nebuchadnezzar's dream and, and about the statue with the uh, various metals and uh, pointing to future kingdoms. And... And, and the end of that interpretation of that dream, telling the king the dream and then interpreting the dream led to them uh, being promoted and Daniel being promoted. And, and uh, now you come into chapter three and we kind of jump forward 10 to 15 years. There's a little bit of a, everything, I guess, we don't have any information in between there, but apparently yeah, things are just kind of going along. And you jump forward about 10, 15 years into chapter three. I titled the message this morning, Choosing Integrity 
over compromise from Daniel chapter 3. Decisions of integrity always come with a price. There's a price for integrity. There's a price for compromise. No matter which one you choose, there is always a price. The question is, which price do you want to pay? The one for integrity or the one for compromise? In uh, verses 1 to 7, and we're going to, the, the whole chapter is what we're looking at, so we're just going to kind of move through it. But verses 1 to 7, uh, Nebuchadnezzar decides to make, now understand, we're 10, 15 years later, all right? So he's had the dream about him and, and, and being the golden head and then the, the silver arms and the and upper torso and the, the body of bronze and the legs of iron and feet. No, he's had that dream. That was the original dream. Now, 10, 15 years later, he gets this idea about, you know, that was a nice statue, but I think I can do a little better than that. And in verses 1 to 7, it says that he decides to build a statue of all gold. I mean, after all, he was the head, so why not just make the whole statue and make it all gold? And so that's what he does. Uh, he builds it, and it describes it as 90 feet tall. That's like saying, uh, you, for me, I, I can better equate it to saying it's a nine-story building. Nine stories high. Nine feet wide, and, and it's, we don't, it doesn't say it's just it's a statue. The assumption is that it's of him, but, but that's, that's the idea. Um, they actually, interestingly enough, his, history records, and if it hasn't been recently destroyed, six miles outside of Babylon is a, a, the plain of Dura, and there's a platform out there, 45 feet in diameter, made of brick and 20 feet high, a pedestal, sitting six miles outside of Babylon. He calls a meeting. He builds a statue. He calls the meeting. He calls people and the, the, the dignitaries, the, the rulers, the satraps, the governors, the, everybody from all over the world that are underneath his kingdom and under his authority and says, come on down. We're going to have a dedication service for this new statue that I've made. So they come around and he's there to show off, uh, wants to show off a statue. By the way, uh, have you ever had an idea that started off sounding like it was a good idea, but ended up being a really bad idea later on? Um, that's Nebuchadnezzar. He's the gold head on the statue and and we're just going to make this thing. And Well, as long as you're all here, by the way, when you hear the sounds of all the things you're supposed to bow down and worship, it went bad fast. Bad idea. Well, I do make a rather magnificent statue, don't I? Everybody bow down. Look at verse 8. We skip forward verse 1 to 7. So here's verse 8. Uh, at this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I have made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. I said in your outline, the first thing, if you're choosing integrity over compromise, it's going to mean that you need to be prepared. Be prepared. Uh, You've watched the news on Hurricane Matthew. Uh, how many of you uh, have checked your flashlight batteries? 
You know when you check your batteries? When you don't have any power. And then you go and you go, oh, and you're in dark. You, got, you know how many people are out of power? Over 2 million people. That's like half of the Phoenix metropolitan area is out of power. You suppose they wish they'd been a little, they tried to prepare, didn't they? You seen the news, they, Home Depot and Lowe's are all bought out. There's nothing left. They've got it all. And people were trying to be prepared. Do you have uh, emergency cash somewhere? You got a little extra food set up somewhere? Water? Gas? Are you prepared? If anything really bad ever happens, I'm going to my father-in-law's house. He's got everything. The man has everything. It's worth whatever gas I've got. I'll put it in my car, drive down there, and live there. He's got it all. He's prepared. Uh, they had a they have a name for the group. If you people who are preparing for the end times, if you call it end times or or catastrophic end of the world or however you want it, they call them preppers. Preppers. If uh, if you're prepping for the end of the world as it's known. Uh, there's a guy here in Phoenix that has a thousand tilapia in his pool, just in case. You know, he's going to have food. And people have, you know, they have 50 years of food. They're ready to, to, you know, go to the end of whatever may happen. And I, I'm not promoting the, uh, being a prepper or anything like that. I'm just saying it's not a bad idea to be, you know, a little prepared. You might want to check your smoke alarm and your batteries and have some things. Being prepared. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were prepared. Now, the first couple chapters kind of give you a little bit of that story, but obviously because they were prepared through their circumstances. They'd already gone through being conquered and defeated and enslaved and challenged and indoctrinated and a death sentence. I mean, they'd gone through quite a bit. All of that was by God's design preparation for them. And now at 30 years of age, they come to this point of a very difficult decision. But they have been prepared. Now, they, they could have rationalized the situation, right? I mean, you're standing there, and, and the horn and the stuff goes off, and you're thinking, okay, I, I mean, after all, maybe it's, we'll just, there's, we'll only do it this one time. We'll, we'll bow down. It's the dedication service. We'll bow down one time. It's not really a big deal. I mean, after all, we know that there is only one God. Or, well, I'll bow with my knee, but not with my heart. I mean, they, they could have come up with quite a few rationalizations for bowing. It just wouldn't have been that difficult. But they said, but, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not making this decision in a vacuum without any preparation, without any foundation or experience or, or any of that. They, they were at that moment prepared to make the decision. Uh, by the way, decisions are value-driven. What I mean by that is what we really care about determines what we do. What we really care about is, you know, we call that our, our values, are the accumulation of things and ideas and principles and people over the course of our lives. Those are the things that we care about. Those are the things that we value. They're not things that we just suddenly come upon. You don't just suddenly develop values. Oh, no, it's something that you have developed over the course of your life. Decisions over a long period of time. Things that we have uh, consistently given a priority to over the long haul, over the course of time, they become uh, embedded into our DNA, our personalities. They become a part of who we are, how we think, how we act and react. They prepare us for our critical moments of decision. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been prepared for this moment. They'd already determined what their values were. They knew what they were going to do. They, they said to the king, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. It's already a done deal. We've already decided we know where we stand. They were prepared. The second thing in your outline, I, I said to uh, 
Well, verse 17, let's read it. It says, if we are thrown in, this is what their response to Nebuchadnezzar. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. I said in your outline, count the cost. Uh, if you're going to be able to choose integrity over compromise, you're going to have to be able to count the cost. Nebuchadnezzar's uh, furnace, <clears throat> uh, we, obviously, we're not completely certain of what it was like. We have some history that tells us that it more than likely it was like a kiln. Uh, they uh, worked iron. That was part of what they did in that time, in that era. Um, by the way, you know what, what temperature iron melts? I had to look it up. 2,200 degrees. That's where iron melts. They worked iron. They had smelters for it. They had a, they had a kiln that, that was designed to do that. And they, they figure out what they've seen and, and uh, a little bit of history and, and drawings and things is that there was an opening on the top and on the bottom where they stoked the fire to make it hot in a brick. They believe it was made out of brick, a brick kiln. So they're, they're figuring that somewhere in that range of between 1,000, 1,500, 2,200 degrees that they can heat that thing up to do the kinds of things that they did in the day. That's his furnace more than likely. By the way, you know a forest fire burns at about 1,500 degrees? You get a really hot one? About 1,500 degrees. The three guys say, we will not bow down to another god, whether we live or die. We will not bow down. Our God is able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, it doesn't really matter. We follow God no matter what. We've counted the cost. We know how much it's going to cost us. Uh, you may not be. Your choice may not be a fiery death. Your cost. But choosing integrity over compromise could cost you. Could cost you a promotion. Could cost you a big payout or a, a new job. It could cost you your job. Could cost you an opportunity or a, a friend or a family member when you choose integrity over compromise. If you choose compromise, it could cost you sleep. Anxiety, peace of mind. It could cost you emptiness of soul, loneliness, purpose, motivation. It could cost you joy, fulfillment. It could cost you your health. It could cost you your spouse, your family, your children, your parents, your friends. When you choose to compromise, it can cost you your relationship with God. There's a price. Count the cost of what you choose. There's always a cost. And it's never about what it costs you just today. It's about what it costs you tomorrow and every day after that for the rest of your life. That's the cost. It's kind of like, uh, compromise is kind of like, remember the old payday loans, what they used to refer to as payday loans, the old ones? It's where you get in and they say, well, we, you can pay us this much. You can pay us just, and you think, wow, that's a great deal. That's very affordable until you figure out that you pay it that way for the rest of your life because you can't pay it off at that rate. That's kind of how compromise is. You think, well, I, I can do that. Yeah, but are you prepared to pay for it for the rest of your life? Pretty hefty price. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, this is a no-brainer. Living or dying didn't matter. There's only one choice for them. There was only following God. They'd counted the cost. Here's the third. Uh, Look at verses 19 to 23. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men 
wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent that the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Now, I said in your outline, uh, if you're going to choose integrity over compromise, you need to learn how to accept God's sovereignty. Accept God's sovereignty. They, they said to the king, our God is able to deliver us. He will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're willing to accept what God allows into our lives. Believing that God has the bigger picture in mind, that the universe is not necessarily revolving around our lives, but around God's plan. And God's plan for our lives may end here. Maybe we have served our purpose in this world, and now is our time to go home and be with God. God's sovereignty. Now, you kind of... You know, one minute you're declaring that you believe that God will deliver you, you're perfectly fine with whatever happens, and the next minute they're tying you up and carrying you up to the top and getting ready to drop you in. But they had already decided that they would accept God's sovereign will for their lives. And if that meant the end, then that was okay with them. Because they knew that God had a bigger plan, and they were a part of it. I really do think that one of the biggest issues that people have with God is this issue of sovereignty. That's where most of us have a problem. We're okay until God exercises sovereignty in our lives, and then we go, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It is our natural bent to believe that our interests, our desires, our needs are the most important thing in this world, and that we should have the right to choose. The right to choose how things are going to be. And somewhere in there, we have an innate sense of what we believe is right or good or fair for us. And we kind of know, all right, this is what I think is right or fair or good for me. Not realizing that our ideas and our rights and our desires are probably in direct contradiction to the person sitting right next to us. You remember the movie Bruce Almighty? It was kind of this little comedy about what would happen if you got to be God for a day or a couple days and got to choose. And in the movie, the character decides he gets all these prayers and all the, through his email. He gets all these prayers. People, well, I want this, I want that, I want this. He finally goes, oh, give everybody what they want. And it was total chaos. Total chaos. Because what we want doesn't necessarily line up with what God is about. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were already prepared. They had already counted the cost. They had already trusted God's sovereignty. They already knew, God, it really, Nebuchadnezzar, it doesn't really matter. We're not bowing down. There is only, we choose, we choose God. We trust Him. We trust His sovereign plan for our lives. we tend to cringe at the suggestion that we should submit our wills to, a, to someone else or even God. But by definition, God is sovereign. You cannot have God without God's sovereignty. Anything less than a God without absolute sovereignty would be nothing more than another created being another human, a limited part of the universe that will someday come to an end. Even creation itself as it exists has an end. But God, the sovereign God of the universe, has no beginning and no end. He is the eternal one. And this is precisely why Christianity is not, a very, not very popular in our world because of the sovereign God. God has declared his sovereignty and has set out the only path to eternal life as coming through Jesus Christ. It's the only path to God. 
trusting in Jesus' life and death and resurrection and finally coming to the point of surrender. Surrender of our lives and wills to Him. By God's grace. Putting our faith in Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, I am the way, the, way, the truth, the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. As a whole, we want to think that we have options. We want to choose our path. But our hearts are not bent toward God. Mostly bent toward ourselves. I still have one more point in my outline, but I really kind of feel like I need to say this to you this morning, right now. You really only have one choice. You either choose God's way through Jesus Christ or you do not. You either surrender your life to Jesus Christ and receive God's gift of heaven or eternal life is in heaven is not really an option for you. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there is only one choice. God. Faith in Christ. So they throw them down. Look how the story continues. Verse 24, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them, and they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. I said in your outline, if you're going to choose integrity over compromise, you need to give God praise. God intervenes, preventing the flames and the heat from, that, that killed the soldiers from killing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Instead, it says that he sent an angel, or some people actually think it was, uh, it was Christ, pre-incarnate, a Christophany to be with the men in the furnace. Wouldn't you like to have been a part of that conversation? Shadrach, do you feel the heat? I'm not even breaking a sweat. Well, now that you mention it, this guy is on fire. Not exactly. Actually, uh, we don't get any of that. The uh, conversation is immediately about God. There is only one God who can do this. The only God. Even unbelieving pagan King Nebuchadnezzar came to the sudden awareness of the existence of one true God. Nebuchadnezzar immediately recognized that their integrity and courage of the three men and decided that he needed to have them in positions of greater authority in the kingdom. While, you're, uh, while secular leadership may not affirm your Christian faith, they will affirm and reward integrity, courage, commitment, Honesty. 
And in the end, it isn't about whether or not you're rewarded or recognized. It's about whether or not you've been faithful to God, obedient to Jesus Christ. Whether or not you've given God the credit for what has taken place in your life. Give God praise for what He has done. The message this morning is fairly simple. Choose integrity over compromise. Choose God. Choose Jesus Christ over anything this world may have to offer you. Because in the end, there's really only one choice. There's only one way to God. It's through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we come this morning, as we recognize that you and you alone are worthy of our lives, you and you alone are worthy of our uh, surrender. God, we pray that we would be people of integrity, that we'd be prepared. that we would choose you over anything else in this world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing. As we sing, I want to invite you. If you're sitting here thinking this morning, um, that's me. I need to choose. There is only one God. There is only one choice. There is only one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. I give you an opportunity to choose Him this morning. Say yes. Uh, oh, whatever it is. It, for you, it may be just deciding, you know what? I need to choose to be a Christian who lives with integrity and chooses Jesus and obeys Him no matter what the choice. Maybe you've got some tough calls and some tough decisions that you're in, your, in your job. Maybe in your house. And you got to make some tough calls. Am I going to be a person of integrity or am I going to compromise? Am I going to follow God or not? You need to choose invite you this morning as we sing. You can come, you can spend some time in prayer, you can talk with me, whatever you need to do to choose him this morning, you do it as we sing.